Hello everyone. Don't worry, you haven't downloaded the wrong podcast. This is the History of Byzantium, and Robin will be with you in just one minute to tell you all about the Roman relationship with the Balkans in the 10th century. Among other things, recently in the region, the northwestern Slavic tribes, led by their chieftain Tomislav, have put a new kingdom on the map. Croatia. Fast forward 900 years. Tomislav's kingdom still exists, but it has long been conquered by and subjugated to the Habsburg Austrian Empire. But not for much longer. Croatia will soon break away to help form a new country, an experiment unique to the 20th century, Yugoslavia. If this has piqued your interest, and you'd like to hear more, please check out the History of Yugoslavia podcast on iTunes and all good podcast apps, or at ethnopolis.co.uk. But before you do, listen to Robin Pearson's wonderful narration of the next chapter in the history of the great empire where it all began. Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium. Episode 154 a cat among mice. Last time, we introduced Basil II, the man who would become the longest reigning emperor in Roman history. Today we discuss his first decade as undisputed Vasilevs and the theatre of war where he will spend the majority of his time. During our mini end-of-the-century tour in 976, we discussed how little we know about the Roman conquest of Bulgaria. John's victory at Dristra had delivered to him the core lands between the Hemus Mountains and the Danube. However, the Byzantines didn't have many men spare to occupy the country, so they set up garrisons at a few key strongholds and relied on local leaders and officials to run the place. The same people who had been loyal subjects of the Tsar only a few months earlier. We don't know how far west Roman control extended, and we know nothing about the reaction in the rest of the realm. As you know, the Bulgarian kingdom stretched from the Black Sea to the Adriatic, and from the Danube to the Pindus Mountains looking down on Greece. How many people identified themselves as patriotically Bulgarian is impossible to say. We know that both Christianity and the written Slavic language were spreading, opening up connections between previously disparate peoples. But for the most part, the Balkans remained a collection of independent communities spread across mountainsides and river valleys. The great achievement of Krom, Simeon, Boris and the others had been to forge a political state which won the allegiance of these different peoples. When that state was shattered, both by the Rus and the Romans, men across the Balkans had to look out for themselves. Some communities may have been pleased to gain greater independence, others probably feared for the future. It was not just the Byzantines that the Bulgarian army had protected them from. The Magyars and the growing power of the Serb and Croat kingdoms to the northwest also loomed. If John hadn't died and instead had marched across the Western Balkans demanding submission from these communities, he might well have got it. It would make no sense for them to make an anti-Roman stance alone, but when Zimisces died and the Byzantines began fighting each other, it left space for a new Bulgarian kingdom to rise in the vacuum. We have almost no information on the process by which this came to be. All we have are the Roman historians. They tell us that the men who founded the new Bulgarian state were the Komitopoli, the sons of the Count. Presumably, this was a Bulgarian official from the Macedonian mountains who held a title similar 
to the Roman rank of comes, or count. We know he was a Christian because his four sons were named Samuel, David, Moses, and Aaron. It was these men who rallied the people of Western Bulgaria to their banner. Their home base was around the lakes, Orid and Prespa, in the heart of the Macedonian mountains. You can see all this on the map I created at the website or on social media. The rise of the Komitopoli must have involved a local power struggle that we know nothing about. The timeline is also confused, but here's what we think we know. When Zimiskis retired the Bulgarian monarchy, he took the royal family with him to Constantinople. This included the sons of Tsar Peter, Boris II, and Roman. Despite being an adult, Roman was castrated to prevent any future children from causing trouble. Shortly after John's death, the two men left Constantinople and made for Macedonia. We're told contradictory stories about why. One source says they escaped, another that they were released. Either way, Boris died on the journey, allegedly killed by a Bulgarian soldier who mistook him for a Byzantine. But the eunuch Roman continued on and made his way to the Komitopoli. The brothers hailed him as Tsar, but kept real power for themselves. He was a vital figurehead in establishing the legitimacy of their state. By this point, the Bulgarian patriarch Damien had also moved to Macedonia. Regardless of the exact ethnicity or belief system of the Macedonian elite, it was clear that with emperor and archbishop on board, it was the Bulgarian kingdom of Krom, Boris and Simeon that was being revived. In the decade between Zimiskis' death and Basil's disastrous campaign, the new Bulgarian state began to grow. Presumably, the brothers marched around the Western Balkans, bringing other communities into the fold. Even with the presence of Tsar Roman, many would have been sceptical, both of the right of the Komitopoli to rule over them, and of the likelihood of their army withstanding the inevitable confrontation with Byzantium. It's in this context that we should understand Basil's campaign of 986. Had the Romans won, it's possible that many local leaders would have abandoned the Komitopoli, either submitting to the emperor or preferring to remain independent. Instead, Samuel, who had presumably grown up in the mountains, outwitted the Byzantines and pulled off a hugely significant victory. Not only did he rout the emperor's forces, but he inadvertently sparked another round of civil war. This would end up giving him four years in which he could campaign unopposed. It would be Samuel who would emerge as the sole survivor amongst the brothers. Apparently Moses and David were killed in battle, and Aaron was executed by Samuel in the aftermath of the victory at Trajan's Gate. The timeline remains speculative, but while Basil was busy with Phocas and Scleros, Samuel achieved the following. He campaigned against the Serbian states to the north and made diplomatic contact with the Magyars. He led a major raid into northern Greece and besieged the city of Larissa, the headquarters of the theme of Hellas. The citizens ran out of food and surrendered. Samuel ordered the population to be transported into his realm and took the relics of local saints with him too. He marched into the Bulgarian heartlands north of the Hemus and drove out the Byzantine garrisons he found. It's possible that the Romans hung on to their naval bases along the Danube, but otherwise, John's conquests were undone. 
the local Bulgarians helped re-establish their realm, although the capital would remain in the harder-to-reach mountains of Macedonia. Finally, Samuel agreed to marry Agatha, the daughter of the leading man of Dyrrhachium, John Chryselios. As you know, Dyrrhachium was the port city on the Adriatic, which controlled the start of the Via Ignatia, the road which ran from the coast via Thessalonica to Constantinople. Here we get a truer sense of Roman control of the Adriatic. Dyrrhachium had remained part of the empire throughout the centuries, but here Chryselios was willing to make a deal with a powerful warlord like Samuel. It suggests that either loyalties were flexible, or that there was coercion involved. Either way, this closed off the possibility of Constantinople launching an attack from that direction. In 14 years, Samuel and his brothers had reconstructed much of the Kingdom of Bulgaria, and were once again terrorizing Roman communities. The people of Greece certainly felt that the bad days of Simeon had returned. And in Constantinople, the mood was bleak as Byzantium emerged from the Civil War. A pro focas scribe wrote a poem calling on Nicephorus to rise from his grave and restore the Roman position. With the Civil War over, Basil set his sights on Bulgaria. Samuel's state had become both a physical and an ideological thorn in the Roman side. Physically, by capturing an invading Byzantine territory, ideologically, because Zimis Keys had already retired the Bulgarian state. He had dedicated their crown jewels to God. Now another Tsar had risen, making a mockery of John's offering. On a personal level, there was an element of revenge for Basil, given how humiliating the defeat at Trajan's Gate had been. But don't be seduced by stories that Basil was consumed with vengeance. He may have simply been concerned to spend time in the field with his army, to earn the respect of his men and begin the transfer of loyalty from the magnates to himself. As you will get fond of hearing, it's difficult to construct a narrative out of the events which followed. Basil's whole Bulgarian war has an impressionistic feel to it. I will mention some dates, but our chronicler, John Skylitzes, gives us a list of incidents with no clear guide as to when each occurred. For those who've studied the map, you'll see that Thessalonica is not very far from the Macedonian mountains. The plain between the two became a key battleground, and Basil certainly spent time trying to capture the fortresses in the foothills to try and secure the area. These sieges were not always successful. The danger for the Romans was that as soon as they entered the mountains, they were vulnerable to surprise attack. Gregory of Tehran was killed in just such an ambush at some point before 995, his replacement as Dukes of Thessalonica would suffer a similar fate. His name was John Chaldos, and he seems to have brought more eastern troops with him, as the emperor realised how tough this assignment was. Basil seems to have been on campaign every year from 991 to 94, and this is the period when there was a long interregnum in the office of Patriarch. It seems that Basil did not return home during some of those winters, or if he did, he wasn't around long enough to choose a new archbishop. Basil attempted to enlist Serbian support against Samuel, but without any effect that we can discern. Ideally, of course, Basil would have met Samuel in a pitched battle and used the superior Roman forces to grind him down but the Bulgarians remained elusive and used guerrilla tactics. Only once in this period did the two sides come face to face, along the Axios River, with the Romans emerging victorious. 
This cleared their path to capture the city of Skopje, where they found the eunuch Tsar Roman. He was treated well, and actually given both a court title and command of Abydos on the Hellespont. As we'll see over the course of his reign, Basil used both carrot and stick in equal measure. Roman was harmless, so instead of making him a martyr, he was given a generous retirement. The hope being that other commanders would consider defecting for a similar deal. In 995, the Vasilefs was forced to rush east to deal with the Fatimids, which we'll discuss in a moment. The following year, John Chaldos was captured in another well-laid ambush. This is probably one of those examples where Basil refused to leave a significant force in the care of another general with bad results. Chaldos would remain in Bulgarian custody for 22 years. With the emperor away, Samuel went on the offensive and raided Greece again. Basil responded by sending one of the few men he truly trusted, Nicephorus Uranos. Yes, the man who'd brought Ibn Sharam to Constantinople was given the title of domestic, meaning he could command all Roman forces in the West. This was still the summer of 996, and Samuel, having routed the main Roman force in the region, decided to press his advantage. He marched south into Greece and led a deep raid all the way to the Peloponnese, capturing much booty. But this gave Uranos a chance to rally the Romans. Gathering everyone he could, he marched into Greece as Samuel was on his way home. Uranos quickly crossed by Mount Olympus and made for Larissa. He left most of the army's baggage there and pushed on with only lightly armoured troops. He force-marched them through the plains, crossing the spot where Pompey and Caesar had fought their decisive battle, and managed to reach the Spertius River before the Bulgarians could cross it. Uranos deliberately camped on the opposite bank to Samuel, giving the impression that the Romans were staying put. The weather was awful. A big storm had blown up and the river was in flood. The Bulgarians were confident that there was no way the Romans could reach them. Uranos ordered his scouts to ride up and down the soggy bank until they found a ford. He then forced his men across. They arrived at the Bulgarian camp in the middle of the night, soaking wet, but achieved total surprise. The camp was not properly defended, and many of Samuel's men were slaughtered as they woke. Apparently, Samuel and his son were wounded in the fighting and hid amongst the dead bodies to evade capture. They managed to slip away and traversed the mountains to reach home, but it was still a devastating defeat. Uranos dispatched hundreds of prisoners back to Constantinople, where they were greeted with great enthusiasm. We have a letter from a Byzantine cleric who wrote about this event. If his mood is typical, then it seems that Uranos's victory was quite unexpected. The emperor had had little luck getting to grips with the Bulgarians, and they had been raiding with impunity for a decade now. Plus, Uranos was not a magnate general. He was a palace bureaucrat. Like Basil, he'd learnt about the army by reading military manuals. It seemed that the emperor's regime could win God's favour, after all. Our sources remain meagre, but according to one, Samuel sued for peace. With Byzantine pride restored and the Bulgarian Tsar in his care, Basil was amenable to this. However, the following year, 997, Roman passed away. With his prestige damaged by the defeat on the Spertios, Samuel decided to bolster it by declaring himself Emperor of the Bulgarians. As we discussed earlier, the Romans had retired this title. Its revival was a direct challenge to their authority and propaganda. Basil would have to return to campaigning to cut Samuel down to size. 
the war will continue next time. For now, we need to cover Basil's concurrent campaigns in the east against the Fatimids. As we discussed in our mini end of the century tour, there were definitely those in Roman high command who felt that further expansion in the east was pointless. And Basil was definitely in this camp. His aim in Syria was to maintain the status quo, no more, no less. He was happy to keep Aleppo as a protectorate and defend it from Fatimid incursions, but beyond that, he wasn't interested in anything else. Uh, well, except capturing Tripoli, the long-desired Roman target on the coast, but we'll get to that. The last time we were here was just before the civil war started. The Fatimids attempted to besiege Aleppo, and Bardas focus drove them off. An action replay took place in late 990. Aleppo appealed to Rome for help, and Michael Vortzis, the governor of Antioch, marched to their aid. However, the Fatimid caliph al-Aziz was determined to capture the emirate. An army moved north from Damascus in 992 and besieged Aleppo again. Messengers had to travel all the way to Bulgaria to find the emperor, who approved the request for Vortzis to intervene. But the problem was that the Fatimids had sent a large army, at least 20,000 strong, whereas Vortzis only had about a quarter of that number. The majority of Roman troops were in Bulgaria with the emperor, and so the ensuing confrontation was a walkover for the caliphate. Vortzis wisely withdrew his forces back to Antioch and had to endure the humiliation of having the city's suburbs looted, including his own estate. However, the distraction stopped the Fatimids from attacking Aleppo, and they returned home for the winter. In 993, the Fatimids captured Apamea, one of Aleppo's satellite cities, and then returned to besiege the capital in 994. Again, messengers raced across the empire and found Basil in Bulgaria. Again, he approved Vortzis' intervention and sent some reinforcements. The Romans nipped at the heels of the invaders until the Fatimids forced a pitched battle in a valley north of Apamea. The smaller Byzantine force routed, and in the ensuing chase, thousands died. This was a decisive defeat, which delivered the field to the Fatimids. Their siege of Aleppo was set up by midsummer, and they were ready to stay through the winter, confident that they could starve the city into submission. Messengers made the familiar trek to find the emperor in Bulgaria. If Aleppo fell, Antioch would be vulnerable, and the Fatimids had shown a propensity to roll from one conquest straight to the next. Basil was initially unconvinced, and with winter setting in, he stayed where he was. However, as the months passed, increasingly desperate messages kept arriving from the emir, who by now was the grandson of Saif ad -Dola. As soon as spring appeared, the Vasilevs moved at express pace. He mounted his entire army, giving each member of the infantry two mules, one to carry the man, and the other his equipment. An army and baggage train moving at a normal pace would have taken at least two months to complete the 700-mile journey. Basil arrived in 17 days. He refused to wait for stragglers and force-marched the entire army across Anatolia. Naturally, many units fell well behind, but the emperor and his elite cavalry pushed on into Syria as quickly as they could. Fatimid scouts were astonished to see the banners of the Vasilefs in the distance. They raced back to Aleppo to tell their shocked commander. The besieging army were not ready for battle. Their cavalry were dispersed, looking for good pasture. In a panic, the general abandoned the siege and retreated south. Had he stayed, his men would have comfortably outnumbered the exhausted Romans. Surprise in warfare 
remained a potent weapon. If Basil had had any desire to rule directly over Aleppo, this was the moment to act. The city was close to starvation and completely at his mercy. But the emperor had no ambition in that direction. Instead, he acted as the perfect ally. He cancelled their tribute payment for the year to help them recover, and then marched around, ejecting Fatimid garrisons from their territory. Once his whole army had arrived, what did they do with all the mules? Anyway, once they'd arrived, he marched on Apamea and retook it in a day. He followed up by taking back Homs and a string of other forts. He pillaged Fatimid territory, and when he was attacked by local Bedouin, he captured 40 of them and cut off their hands. No more attacked him after that. The only blemish on the campaign was the failure to take Tripoli. Once again, the Romans sat outside the walls, unable to make an impression on the port city. It remained the only target the empire really wanted, as it maintained an excellent harbour for the Egyptian navy to reach Syria. After a month of waiting, the emperor gave up, repaired some forts around Antioch, and then headed home. Basil's incursion had been a solid success. It was very much like Zimisces' raid back in 975, in that it demonstrated Roman power and restored their dominance of northern Syria. The Fatimids now knew that if they wanted to capture Aleppo, they would have to contend with the full weight of Byzantium. I can't improve on this quote from Antony Cordelis. Basil appeared as a cat among mice, bringing overwhelming and terrifying force that instantly changed the balance of power. The image of Basil racing from Bulgaria to Aleppo is one of the most memorable of his reign. It's one of those great snapshots that capture in one moment the strengths and weaknesses of a leader. Basil was an all-action emperor, willing to lead his men through any hardship in person. He would strain every sinew to protect the empire's interests, and was praised by Muslim writers for honouring his agreements. However, should a Vasilevs have to break land speed records in order to defend the frontiers? Basil's inability to trust his subordinates meant that the empire was ill-equipped to face two enemies at the same time a problem which will become even more relevant in the decades after his death. It's interesting to note that while Basil was busy, he appointed Nicephorus Uranos to take command in Bulgaria. The result was the smashing victory on the Spercios River. Had he trusted, say, Michael Vortzis with more men, perhaps he wouldn't have needed all those mules. Vortzis, though, may be a bad example. He was just the sort of magnate adventurer who Basil was suspicious of, and after this failure, he'd finally run out of chances. Remember that it was Vortzis who'd disobeyed orders to capture Antioch in the first place, who'd then helped murder Nicephorus, and fought on every side in the civil wars. The fact that he'd survived all of that suggests that his troops were very loyal to him, and that he'd been too valuable for Basil to discard. Now, as he removed Michael from office, the emperor placed him under house arrest, presumably to prevent him from any rebellious inclinations on his way out the door. Next time, the Fatimids returned to Aleppo to continue the war and Basil returns to Bulgaria to try and track down Samuel. In the meantime, for those who'd like to know more about modern Balkan history, check out the History of Yugoslavia podcast with Alex Cruikshanks. He's dealing with the collapse of Ottoman dominance of the area, and has already reached the period just before the First World War. Find the show wherever you get your podcasts or visit ethnopolis.co.uk.